in warfare, the demanding and deadly challenge of extreme ballistic accuracy falls on the shoulders of the sniper. His mission, pure and simple, is to hit the bullseye. Sniper ready. Send it. Trainees learn the art, and experts hone it. Good to go. At the U.S. Army Sniper School at Fort Benning, Georgia. One of the most devastatingly accurate rifles they work with requires a two-man team to operate effectively. The Barrett M107. The M107 fires magazines of 10.50 caliber rounds. To cushion the recoil and increase accuracy, the barrel assembly itself absorbs force as each bullet exits, moving inward against large springs built into the receiver, the central mount that holds the firing mechanism. Each round speeds toward the target at 2,850 feet per second. In this exercise, the challenge for Sergeant Anthony Palka and Staff Sergeant Rodney Medley Send one more. is to hit three separate bullseyes from a range of over 400 yards. All right, give me a uh, left half minute. Medley, the spotter, uses a more powerful scope to determine the precise coordinates. Palki, the sniper, must adjust to those coordinates. Left, half a minute. Send one more. To have a chance of hitting the bullseye. The M107's accuracy has one crucial variable working against it at Fort Benning, the wind. The wind conditions are real rough. From three to 500 meters, it's all open from here to 500 meters out. So you've got the wind that just pushes from the right to left. All right, 12 o'clock, four inches, send another. The bigger the bullet, the greater the wind's effect on its flight. And the M107 fires a big armor-piercing incendiary round. This one? This is a standard API round, and this will be your M107 round. The wind will push this bullet all over the place if you're not careful and know what you're doing with it. Given the wind, can the sniper team, using this precisely engineered weapon, hit three bullseyes more than a quarter mile in the distance? Target three, identified. 437 meters. 437, index. Give me a half right. Half right. And send it when you're ready. Ready. Send it. Move to the right, V target. Target on the left, it's the shorter one. Roger, got shorty. All right, let's see what happened to the target. <laughs> yes, the M107, devastating. Punches holes through the target. This is a one inch Iron Maiden. And what this round has done, not only has it punched a hole, but it's melted a hole through this target. That's why we call it the API, the armor piercing incendiary round. We hit it here in the chest, over here on the side, and up in the head. Yeah, that person's not having a good day. This other little target, well, looks like it was blown off of its braces. We got a solid hole, and then we got a glancing blow there after it fell down. And if anyone was driving this vehicle, as this poor sucker was, you can see here where all the black marks are. These are holes that have been punched through. Devastating effect of the M107 with an API round. Once they dial in, these guys can hit bullseyes a quarter mile away all day. But how about a tank? from a range of over half a mile. They recalibrate for just below the tank's turret. Send it when you're ready. Bullseye. Hyper-accurate rifles like the M107 can trace their origins to some pioneering weapons of the past. The first, says U.S. Army historian David Stichon, is the Pennsylvania flintlock from the 1700s. This is a replica of about a 1760 flintlock Pennsylvania rifle. This is a 54 caliber solid soft lead rifle ball. And it's just like the ones that the less accurate smoothbore muskets fired, but the difference is that it's wrapped in a greased patch 
This loading block has got balls already patched and greased with sheep tallow and beeswax, which allows it to load very tightly in the inside of the barrel. So when it's fired, the bullet is spun by the twisted grooves on the inside of the rifle. What that gives you is greater accuracy and range. You can shoot a deer or a red coat at 300 yards. In its time, the Pennsylvania flintlock rifle was the world's most accurate firearm. But just how accurate was that? Dave's target is 25 yards away. X marks the bullseye. So the old hunters and marksmen would look where they were aiming and look where the bullet went and they would measure to the opposite direction to compensate by aiming here so the bullet would hit here. So this is called Kentucky windage. Let's try it again. Not a bullseye, but plenty close enough to put venison on the table. In the mid 19th century, the Springfield Model 1842 embodied three new advancements in rifle technology that made for greater accuracy. First was a new bullet, the mini ball. The difference is it's shaped sort of like a football and the base of it is hollow. It has a cavity or cone. When it's fired, the powder explodes into this cavity, making a tight fit or seal inside the barrel. This paired with its more aerodynamic shape, maximized both its accuracy and range. So instead of having a 300 yard accuracy, now it's 750 yards. The Springfield's second advancement that increased accuracy was an adjustable sight. It's graduated to every 100 yards all the way up to 900 yards. The third improvement was a percussion cap that ignited the main charge, instead of the flint and steel mechanism used in the flintlock. Not only is this more reliable, but it means that the marksman can have his eyes open when he's pulling the trigger and not have all those tiny pieces of flint and that exploding powder in his face as a distraction. From the same 25 yards, Dave aims again for the bullseye. Is the Springfield indeed more accurate than the flintlock of a century earlier? The experts say, absolutely. But Dave's still slightly off. This next rifle should help him out. The rugged Russian-made Mosin Nagant, first produced in 1891. It served in various modified forms for 60 years and became the weapon of choice for Soviet snipers. Breech loading improved accuracy because now bullets could be made larger than the barrel and be forced in tightly from the breech rather than rammed loose through the barrel. When equipped with a telescopic sight, its accuracy was fearsome. Can Dave finally hit the bullseye using the more advanced rifle? All in all, that's not bad shooting with these old guns. But snipers don't shoot at paper. They shoot watermelons. It's one thing to make a bullseye out of a watermelon. But when you're a cop, the bullseye can fire back. Police departments, including the LAPD, have tried to break down fast, accurate, and responsible shooting to a science. In our presentation to the target, we've broken it down in our teachings to a five count presentation, much like a dance step. Our first count is to maintain our shooting grip and break the safety on the holster. Our second count is to what we call close contact. Third would be to a low ready. Count four, align the sights. And then on count five would actually press the trigger. Rick Bennett has won four world championships in team police pistol competitions. A standard target practice distance for Rick and all police officers is just seven yards, as most shootouts occur within that narrow range. What I'm going to do now is post a competition target, and I'm going to go ahead and shoot that at 25 yards, which would be a distance that we would engage in competition. Rick's competition pistol isn't standard police issue. 
It's a Colt model 1911 chambered in 9mm and the goal here is to place all six rounds right into the 10 ring. I'm going to go ahead and give you six more. You want six more? We're convinced. Eons before ballistics, primitive man began our long journey in search of the bullseye with a spear. About 40,000 years ago, a dart throwing weapon called the atlatl followed, which used leverage to improve upon the spear's range and accuracy. Then 10,000 years ago, the earliest bow and arrow made its mark. Until the advent of firearms, it endured as the most accurate weapon on Earth. Today, its high-tech, hyper-accurate incarnation is the compound bow. Invented for hunting, it's also used in archery competitions. Unlike traditional bows, it has extra stiff limbs made of composite materials which must be bent using a levering system of cables and pulleys. The key to its accuracy, when fully drawn, the pulleys, not the archer, hold part or even most of the draw weight. This allows the archer to draw and aim the bow with much less strain. Levi Morgan and Samantha Klein are the Archery Shooters Association's top-ranked male and female shooters for 2008. We challenge them to hit the bullseye on the foam targets in the distance. That's the main thing in our competition, the unknown distance. And that's what we practice more than shooting or anything. We practice judging yardage. For every yard Levi and Sam misjudge their range, their arrows will strike one inch, high or low, off the bullseye etched on the target side. Nowadays, we shoot a scope with a slide bar where we sight in our own marks, and you just move it to how far you judge the target for. They estimate the target's range at 42 yards, then calibrate their scopes accordingly. The challenge now is to take perfect aim using not only the scope housing, but also the peephole mounted on the bowstring. I'm sighting from the peep to my scope. You want everything to center up on that green fiber. You, that has to be in the center of your peep or you're not gonna hit where you wanna hit. When you come full draw, you want that the size of the opening in your peep to match up perfectly with your scope housing. If you have a bigger hole like this, it's gonna be able to move around in it. You want the same size so it lines up perfectly. A lot of people think it's just a matter of pulling back and letting it go, but uh, something little like that can change it three or four inches. Levi targets the wild boar, Samantha the deer. Is their estimate of the range correct? The only way to find out is to let fly. And fly some more. Bullseye precision worthy of Robin Hood. Can these guys be just as accurate with medieval heavy artillery? Fire in a hole. An SM-3 missile rises from its sleep on a Navy warship. It climbs at over 5,000 miles per hour. Its mission sounds like something out of science fiction. To strike and destroy a US satellite, falling towards Earth at 17,000 miles per hour. If it succeeds, it will be like a bullet hitting a bullet. Bullseye. Astonishing accuracy like this is the culmination of advances by weapons makers dating back to antiquity. George Metz is an expert on the ballista, a torsion-powered projectile launcher first used by the Greeks in the 5th century BC and later by the Romans. It fired a short, heavy arrow called a bolt. I would just look down the barrel, down the slider, which is like the barrel of a rifle, where I feel it's gonna go, and after a few trial shots, I'm probably gonna be on the mark. This is an anti-personnel weapon. It's to fire through an enemy's shield or into his body. 
at a range of 100, 150 feet with accuracy. The accuracy of the ballista was limited, however, as its engineering focused more on power than precision. But could a skilled warrior overcome its design deficiencies? George's target is 50 yards away. It can hit that, yes. One, two, three. George compensates by aiming higher. A little more elevation now. No Roman would give up now, and neither does George. In the Middle Ages, the search for a more consistently accurate projectile launching weapon culminated with the trebuchet. Designed to pulverize the walls of a city or castle under siege, it dominated the landscape of war for over 400 years. This trebuchet is the handiwork of Grig Mullen and Wayne Neal, professors of engineering at Virginia Military Institute. That's got it. Fire in a hole. As a siege weapon, it didn't matter if you were hitting an exact place on the wall as long as every time you fired, you hit the same place. It didn't matter if you were here or here, as long as every time you fired, you hit here. A trebuchet works like a seesaw, using leverage. On one end of a pivoted beam is a sling holding a projectile. On the other end is a counterweight. When the counterweight falls, the beam and sling swing up to a vertical position, where one end of the sling releases propelling the projectile towards the target with great force. And then by adjusting the sling, they'd, they'd um, hit the top of the wall, start to break the wall down, and then adjust the sling length, then just walk the projectiles down the wall and knock chunks out of it so that the troops could go in. We challenge the professors to prove their trebuchet's accuracy by battering this 10 foot by 10 foot target 75 yards away. The first projectiles in their arsenal, watermelons. Three, two, one, fire in a hole. Two variables come into play when adjusting the trebuchet's aim. The weight of the projectile and the length of the sling. We're lengthening the sling to make the same weight projectile. We think we've got another watermelon that's about the same weight release later. We were going over the target. By releasing later, it'll be a flatter trajectory and should be more of a line drive into the target as opposed to a mortar shot over it. Fire in the hole. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes! Yeah, you can see watermelon pieces all over. And that's half inch plywood, which is not negligible. And so a 15 pound watermelon at, at 80 miles an hour pretty well punched through that. Normally, they want to hit the wall perpendicular anyway and not come down on the wall. Next, we challenge the professors to pummel the bullseye with a slightly harder projectile, a 10-pound bowling ball. Oh. Like they did for the watermelon, they'll have to make adjustments to account for the weight of the bowling ball. We need to shorten the sling so it releases and goes higher. You know, we started out positioning the ball right on the center of the runway, and now we're shifting it. Basically, the plane of the sling perpendicular to the axis is about right here. So what we've done is shift the plane this way to get us to where we're throwing slightly to the left. You can do a little bit of adjusting, but other than moving this whole thing. Yeah. Now can they hit the bullseye? Son of a brick. We've got distance. If this was a, a true siege, we'd just knock down this section of the wall instead of this section of the wall. We can try shifting it even further to the left, or we can move the wall over. And... That's an expedient option medieval trebuchet operators didn't have. But it's easier to shift a wooden wall than a 4,000-pound trebuchet. Grig also pounds in stakes to keep track of where the rounds have hit. We moved the wall, and now we hit where the wall used to be. We need to shift to the right some. What I've figured out in the years operating these things is that from the historical record, we got 95% of the story. What we're missing is the last 5% that's the tricks of the trades for a trebuchet operator. And the last one of those guys died 500 years ago. When trebuchets went out of use, that knowledge died. And so the only way we can revive that is what we're doing now, is practice. 
And so we keep trying. And trying. And trying. And trying again. <laughs> Smell burnt rubber. It hit the wall first, and the friction burned the rubber off the outside of the ball. It landed right there. Knocked the stake out that was holding the center of the wall and broke the two by four, and we've ruptured the plywood right there. Although Grig and Wayne never hit the bullseye per se, they think their aim would have been more than good enough for a medieval commander. When we pull the wall out of the way, you see the stakes where we staked every time we've hit, you'll see the pattern that we're just right there. If this was a 20-foot high wall, we'd have pounded the crud out of it by now. By the 14th century, the trebuchet was being eclipsed by a terrifying new long-range weapon, the cannon. But for 500 years, all cannons had smooth bore barrels in which the projectiles fit loosely, making them clumsy at finding the bullseye. But the bullseye finally came within reach in the mid-1800s and America's Civil War. The rifled bore put a new spin on every round fired, revolutionizing the cannon just as it had the musket. This gave them tremendous accuracy and much harder hitting power. It also meant that they could now shoot a cannonball further than the gunners or cannoneers could see. By World War I, the cannon's longer, accurate range had compelled artillery experts to develop innovative new tactics. How do you fire over the horizon several miles to an enemy target that the cannon cannot even see? And so now you're working with maps, you're working with graphs and, and grid lines and this type of thing. You have to have communication from the soldiers who can see the enemy target and tell the cannons where to shoot and how to adjust their rounds onto the target to make it more accurate to hit the bullseye. By the 1940s, artillery experts redefined the parameters of hitting the bullseye with the proximity fuse. Projectiles so equipped no longer had to hit the target to detonate. They exploded within a predetermined range of the target. The fuse is kind of like a radar. It's got a little radio system in it. It will emit a signal in the air, and when it bounces back against a hard object, like an airplane, it explodes. Today, the benchmark for bullseye accuracy in war is the smart bomb. They use laser guidance from other aircraft, you know, a wingman, to point out and paint the target with a laser signal so that these bombs would follow that down to the target. The laser-guided munitions were a tremendous quantum leap forward in guiding munitions. But they had problems. Uh, for one thing, they couldn't see through clouds, or at least the observers or those who were aiming them couldn't see through the clouds. The solution? JDAM, short for Joint Direct Attack Munitions. It's the epitome of ballistic surgical precision. Even when the smallest of targets is concealed by cloud cover or the canopy of night, this smart bomb uses GPS and inertial navigation system monitors to zero in and destroy it. Hitting the bullseye doesn't always require such high tech. All this expert needs is a skilled hand and a girl with guts. David Adamovich, better known as the great Grodini, is a master of one of the most time-honored and dangerous tests of bullseye accuracy, knife throwing. His mastery, however, is to miss. The entertainment value of his art hinges on David's ability to miss his assistant by just the slimmest of margins. Slightest error can have dire consequences. When I'm throwing, that which goes through my head the most is staying away from the girl and being in my zone. My target girl is, in essence, an imaginary blur in the zone that I don't want to throw to versus my focus on the side of the board where I am throwing. For greatest accuracy, impalement artists throw each knife end over end, spinning it like a pinwheel. The number of revolutions increases the farther the thrower is from the target. 
from around seven feet, the shortest standard distance. The knife is held by the blade and makes one half spin. From about 11 feet, the knife is held by the handle and completes one full spin. I'm going to show you how I aim to miss at one and a half spin using Target Girl Tina. To successfully complete a one and a half spin throw, David must move back to a distance of 15 feet. At this range, the chances for error and the dangers multiply. David's not just accurate, but speedy. The Guinness Book of World Records lists him as the world's fastest knife thrower. 10 knives in 4.2 seconds. Speed throwing is very difficult. I'm grabbing knives and throwing knives approximately a quarter second each, so that each throw is about four tenths of a second. So I have to be on my mark perfectly. I have to grab and throw without ever looking at the knives, just watching back and forth where I throw the knife. David's challenge here is to rapidly hurl 10 knives that will alternate on both the right and left side of his partner's body. It's called the ladder of death. I throw anything with a point. The bigger they are, the further out I have to go. And when they get big like this and I go that far back, that is the most dangerous stuff I can do in the impalement arts. And by all means, it makes me most scared. Throwing weapons this dangerous magnifies the need for bullseye accuracy. No one knows that better than Tina, his target girl. I'm fully aware that there exists the possibility of something going wrong. It's the nature of the act. You have to commit to it 100%. It can't be halfway. Go big or go home. It's now do or die. Just when you think things can't get more dangerous, David has one more test of his bullseye accuracy up his sleeve. He will try to sever the straw held between Tina's teeth. There may not be the same element of danger in the game mastered by two-time nine-ball world champion Johnny Archer, but it requires even more precision because each shot requires hitting multiple bullseyes. From the cue striking the cue ball in exactly the right spot, to the cue ball halting in an advantageous position, aligned for the next shot. Johnny makes it all look easy, but he says the hardest shot of all can be the simple looking straight long shot. People think, oh, this is gonna be an easy shot because it's long and straight. The reason I think it's the hardest shot is because you can't miss to hit that cue ball at all on either side. You're going to miss this ball. I've got to hit the cue ball dead center in order to make it hit the one ball dead center straight into the hole and miss it. Uh, we're going to do that again. <laughs> Told you it was hard. Well, as you can see, I missed the bullseye. Okay, and, and the reason I missed it is I hit the cue ball a little bit on the left. When you're hitting a bullseye, you have to hit your aiming point exactly right. Making the cue ball settle precisely where you want on any given shot often requires not striking the cue ball dead center, but to one side or the other to make it spin or give it English. Such shots will prove crucial as Johnny takes on the challenge of pocketing every ball without one miss in a game of nine ball. The rules call for pocketing the one ball first, then all the rest in sequential order, ending with a nine to win the game. When I look at the table, you know, what I see is I try to visualize the last ball I'm going to pocket in, in, to win the game, and I come backwards. Beginning with his last shot, Johnny works backwards in his mind. He mentally plots out the path of the cue ball, determining where each target ball must be pocketed 
and where the cue ball must settle each time to set up the subsequent shot. In this way, he calculates his all-important first shot for pocketing the one ball that will set his strategy in motion. Now I can see everything that I'm trying to do, and it just looks easy to me. Easy? Let's see. Can this world-class player hit every bullseye and run the table? I'm going to pocket the one ball here, and I want the cue ball in this area for the angle for the two. I'm going to hit the cue ball with a little bit of left-hand English to have it come out in the center. Okay. And now I want to hit the two ball, send the cue ball off in this angle. A little bit of left-hand side English on the cue ball so I can kind of control it. I came up a little bit far on the three ball, but I'm still going to pocket it in the side. And I want to send the cue ball to the bottom rail, back out here to this side rail, and in this area here. So three ball on the side, a little bit of high right-hand English. As Johnny attacks the four ball, he demonstrates one of his basic strategies. Always target an area near the center of the table for the cue ball to stop. This increases his options. Now I have the five in the side, but I really have to be conscious of my angle on the six because the seven only goes in this pocket. I got the five in the side, so I have to be able to pocket the six, go back up in this area for the seven. And now I have my angle on the eight, pocketing the eight up in that corner. Now I need to draw it off this side rail and back down table here, low left hand English on this shot. Now back off the side rail. Now here's the winning shot. To make it a little easier for me, a little bit of high left hand English. And that's the winning shot. You give me a spread like that, I'm going to run out about 98% of the time, so that's going to put you in a lot of trouble if you're playing me. Johnny Archer's bullseye precision is evident, but the longest shot he ever takes is nine feet. Imagine hitting a moving bullseye more than 400 million miles away. No one has a keener sense of the bullseye than the engineers at NASA. Mission after mission, they face the challenge of sending spacecraft millions of miles to the smallest of targets at the farthest reaches of our solar system. Main engine start, two, one, zero, and lift off of the Delta II rocket with Phoenix. On August 4th, 2007, with the launch of NASA's Phoenix Mars lander, they took on one of their most daunting tests of precision navigation. Plus 130 seconds, and there's jettison, solid motor jettison. Their challenge? Send Phoenix on a 10-month voyage of 422 million miles to a bullseye on Mars, just 70 miles long and 15 miles wide. The odds were against them. Of the 13 missions that had tried to land probes on Mars previously, only five had succeeded. NASA likened the effort to shooting an arrow from Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, traveling 2,077 miles, and hitting home plate at Wrigley Field in Chicago. NASA's engineers couldn't simply aim Phoenix directly toward Mars. Since the red planet orbits the sun at nearly 54,000 miles per hour, they would have to send their probe toward a point where they calculated Mars would be 10 months in the future. If you're shooting skeet, you don't, you don't aim where the skeet is now. You aim in, in front of it, because you you, you're not going to hit it if you shoot where it is now. you got to anticipate where it's going. But engineers knew that the odds of hitting their bullseye on Mars would be astronomical if they depended solely on the timing and direction of their launch. That's because an interplanetary probe, surprisingly, is at the mercy of countless obstacles in the deceptively tranquil vacuum of space. Launching a spacecraft from Earth and having it get from Earth to Mars is a lot like the game of golf. 
there's wind coming from various directions. There are trees and sand traps along the way too. So in the case of a spacecraft traveling from, from Earth to Mars, we also have winds to contend with. In this case, it's solar winds that affect where the spacecraft is traveling. There's the gravitational forces of the Earth, the moon, the asteroid belt beyond the orbit of Mars, the large planets, Jupiter, Saturn, the sun itself, are forces acting on the spacecraft almost like winds. To keep Phoenix on target, NASA's engineers planned several course corrections at predetermined times during the voyage, using thrusters on the spacecraft. Making those corrections required NASA's engineers to first know Phoenix's precise location, heading, and speed. They acquired this data from the deep space network of antennas, situated in California, Spain, and Australia, which was in constant communication with the spacecraft. On May 17, 2008, 10 months after it departed Earth, Phoenix sped within six million miles of Mars. NASA executed its fourth and final course correction, hurling the spacecraft toward a specific point at the fringe of the Martian atmosphere. Part of the challenge in navigation is hitting a very small pinpoint at the top of the Mars atmosphere to make sure that it actually achieves the small target on the surface as well. One week later, Phoenix successfully hit its mark above Mars. But a final crucial challenge remained, entry, descent, and landing, or EDL. The main purpose of EDL is to take a spacecraft that is traveling at 12,500 miles an hour relative to the surface and bring it to a screeching halt in a soft way in a very short amount of time. Failure now would lay waste to a $457 million project to study the history of water on Mars. We have to make sure that when we hit the atmosphere, we're hitting it at the right speed and we're hitting it at the right angle. If you come in too steep, you can burn up. If you come in too shallow, you can actually kind of go dip into the atmosphere and then skip out and then not land on the planet at all. Phoenix now one minute past the entry point. Could Phoenix complete its 422 million mile odyssey and hit its target zone on the frozen plane below? Phoenix deployed its parachute, standing by for telemetry acquisition. Could the arrow, fired from Dodger Stadium, strike home plate at Wrigley Field? The separation detected. We have reacquired the signal. Gravity turn detected. Altitude 600 meters. 250 meters. 100 meters, 50 meters, standing by for touchdown. Touchdown signal detected. Bullseye. Back on Earth, the challenge for this bunch of high flyers is to hit multiple bullseyes using themselves as projectiles. The challenge of hitting the bullseye enters a whole new dimension when the projectile isn't a bullet, or a billiard ball, or spacecraft, but a human being. No one knows this better than these precise and daring artists preparing for showtime. The cast of Cirque du Soleil's acrobatic production, Mystère, in Las Vegas. The centerpiece of one of their most breathtaking routines is a teeter-totter-like device called the Korean plank. Their bullseye is the 14-inch by 14-inch square at the plank's end. The artists alternate roles as pushers, those who strike the plank, and jumpers, those who are propelled into the air. Not only must their aim be perfect, but also their timing. If they lose their timing, bad things can happen. If a jumper jumps just a little bit late, the pusher feels that the person is very heavy on the other side of the board, and most probably they will get a, a buckle or a, a buckaroo. <laughs> it's not a very technical term, but, but it's, it's a fall, basically, which could injure them and take them out of the show for a few days. If they jump early, now the pusher who's coming from the other side is landing on an empty board and hits the floor really hard and can get injured. So those injuries 
that can happen on both sides of the board, so they must do this extremely well timed. Each acrobat must not only time each move perfectly, but must also trust that his partner will do the same. Without the trust, there's no way to work. They build that trust where they can now blindly jump with each other and throw very complicated tricks, knowing that they will get the proper push and they will land on a board that's not empty, even though they don't know what's going on when they're in the air and flipping and turning, but they just trust that the partner is there because they've built that trust over years. This trust extends to the troop spotters, standing ready during the entire routine. It's their job to help keep the jumpers on target and act as a safety net if a bullseye is missed. I have to read my body language from the top and move here. Because from this position, you know, I'll fall. On the board, the white mark, this is for all of us. It's uh, kind of different colors you can see, so we can see where to put our feet. They don't have too much space. For every jumper after the takeoff, it's not enough to simply hit the plank perfectly on his descent. Unlike a bullet that needs only to travel to its target, these human projectiles have to do it with breathtaking grace and style. You jump higher and higher, straighter and straighter, and you learn basic flip, flipping techniques, you know, sim simple saltos, forward, backwards, twisting, and then later on you start to combine those, flipping and twisting, multiple flipping and twisting, and multiple twisting and multiple flipping. It's showtime. During the five minute routine, the team's challenge is to flawlessly hit the bullseye on the plank 58 times. One error could not only spoil the performance, but result in serious injury. But tonight, they're perfect. These masters of precision make it all look effortless. But hitting the bullseye, in all of its various forms, will always challenge and tantalize us. We constantly seek perfection. A bullseye defines it.